Hello again, everybody. Uh, thank you for the special music. When we have the opportunity to attend other uh, congregations, uh, it reminds us of how privileged we are to have such talent within this congregation. So thank you again. Uh, absolutely beautiful. So to begin this message, I would like to begin reading from Ecclesiastes 3, if we could turn there. And I'm going to bring up the New Living Translation uh, to begin reading. So it's Ecclesiastes 3, the New Living Translation, and it states, for everything there is a season, a time for every activity under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to harvest, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build up, a time to cry and a time to laugh, <clears throat> a time to grieve and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones, a time to embrace and a time to turn away, a time to search and a time to quit searching, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be quiet and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. In Ecclesiastes, it says that there's a season for everything. And a writer gives a listing in verses, through, verses 2 through 8 seven verses of contrast, saying that each has its time. For example, there is a time to cry, but there's also a time to laugh. It's the human condition. Isn't our journey full of contrasts? Then it goes on to verses 9 and 10. What do people really get for their hard work? I have seen the burden God has placed on all of us, yet God has made everything beautiful for its own time. He has planted eternity in the human heart. But even so, people cannot see the whole scope of God's work from beginning to end. With regard to verses 9 through 11, the Bible says commentary makes the following statement. Solomon expresses God's purpose with the phrase, the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. This is a poetic expression of the totality of God's design and purpose for creation, for history, for humanity and the human experience, for this age and for all ages. There is a plan. God has made everything appropriate in its time, but our lot is not to discern that plan through our own experience and reason. We will not find out God's purposes through our own labors. The path to finding meaningful and purpose lies in choosing a perspective that our role in God's plan is a gift of God. We go through life. We have a series of contrasts. And then in verse 11, the writer of Ecclesiastes indicates that through it all, people cannot see the scope of God's work. And it may be within our lives we lose focus. Maybe we are facing challenges, whether positive, whether negative that we may forget about God and his plan, the promises made to mankind, the promises made to us. Today I would like to take a step back and give a message that focuses on the promises God has made to remind us of the perspective we should have as we walk in our journey. The title of today's message God's promises to us in our journey. 
When we examine scriptures, we see that there are two types of promises God gives. They're either conditional or unconditional. According to L.S. Define, a site that focuses on simplifying legal definitions, it states the following. An unconditional promise is when someone says they will definitely do something without any conditions or exceptions. It's like making a really strong commitment to do something and you can trust that they will follow through. An unconditional promise is made without exception. So we can see this in the type of promise God made to Abraham. Turn to Genesis 12, 1 to 3. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. Genesis 12, verses 1 through 3. It states in Genesis 12, verse 1, Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house, to a land I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. Verse 3, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you, and in, all, in you all the families on earth will be blessed. God made a promise to Abraham. No conditions were put on this promise. A great nation was to come from him. Genesis 12, verses 6 through 7. Genesis 12, if we would turn there. Genesis 12, verses 6 through 7. It states, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, Your descendants I will give this land, and there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. Again, Abraham was, prom Abraham was promised land. No conditions were put on that promise. We can also see a type of unconditional promise given to Moses as well. Deuteronomy 31, verse 1. Deuteronomy 31, verse 1. Deuteronomy 31, verses 1 through 3 and then 6. Verse 1, then Moses went and spoke these words to all Israel, and he said to them, I am 120 years old today. I can no longer go out and come in. Also the Lord has said to me, you shall not cross over Jordan. The Lord your God himself crosses over before you. He will destroy these enemies before you, and you shall dispossess them. Joshua himself crosses over before you, just as the Lord has said. And then on to verse 6. Be strong and good courage. Do not be afear, afraid of them, for the Lord your God, he is the one that goes with you. He will not leave you or, nor forsake you. The second type of promise found in the Bible is conditional. And we can see this one in Romans 10 verse 9. Romans 10, verse 9. If we could turn there, Romans 10, verse 9. It states that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The New Living Translation provides the following rendition to this scripture. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Here we can see that an individual will be saved on the condition that if they believe Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. The Bible shows that God is faithful, and we have assurances throughout the Bible that he will keep his promises. Philippians 1, verse 6. Philippians 1, verse 6. And I'll read from the English Standard Version. Philippians 1, verse 6. 
and it states, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Even with that assurance, we have to be in a state to receive what God wants to provide. In other words, we need to do our part. We need to be receptive. We need to be ready to receive those promises. What are we to do? First, we need to commit to live God's way of life. Obedience to God's way of life keeps us connected to God. For, turn to 1 John 5, verses 2 to 3. 1 John 5, verses 2 to 3. First John 5, verses 2 to 3, states, By this that we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. Let's also turn to 1 John uh, chapter 2, verses 3 to 6, and this time I'll read from the English Standard Version. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk the same way in which he walked. We obey his commands. It keeps us connected to God. And we do it because we love God, because it brings the connection to God. It makes us receptive to the promises of God. What else are we to do to be in a state where we can receive God's promises? Exercise faith. Faith is necessary to please God. We can see this in Hebrews 11, verse 6. Hebrews 11, 6, and I'll read from the English Standard Version. It states, And without faith it's impossible to please them, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and rewards those who believe him. I would like to read from an article entitled, Loss of Faith, What to Do When You Feel Like You're Losing It, from Psych Central, October 11, 2022. This is not a religious publication. But I thought the points were very interesting. You might lose faith after a traumatic experience that may make us doubt. Mental health concerns such as depression or anxiety. Experiencing bereavement and wondering whether life is worthwhile. Feeling lonely and disconnected from others. Life changes that make you reassess your beliefs. Experiencing significant personal growth. What shakes our faith? If we find ourselves lacking in faith, as occasionally may happen, we ask God for help. Romans 8.16 states, The Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. When we find ourselves in those times when we are truly overwhelmed by it all, or maybe just whelmed by it all, we can cry out to God like the man in Mark 9, 24, where he says to Jesus, help me in my unbelief. As we know, faith is not something we can conjure up. It's a gift from God. Turn to Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. It states, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Faith is a gift of from God, but we still need to do our part through the studying of God's word, 
through prayer, through encouraging others, living the Christian life. That's how we build faith. We build the connection to God. Romans 10, verse 17. Romans 10, verse 17. It states in Romans 10, verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Faith is a journey. Faith is a walk. It is how we are to function in this life. And we can see that in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 5 through 9. And I'd like to read from the English Standard Version. It states, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us a spirit as his guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, and not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are home or away, we make it our aim to please him. Besides having a commitment to live God's way, to live by faith, what else should we do to be in a position to receive what God has promised? We need to claim the promise. 1 John 5, verse 14. Please turn there, 1 John 5, verse 14. 1 John 5, verse 14. It states, Now this is the confidence which we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. When claiming one of God's promises from Scripture, we should keep these things in mind. God's promises are often conditional. Look for the word if in the context within the Scripture. A promise does not make God bend to our will. We pray according to God's will. And patience. We don't know when or how the promise will be fulfilled. But we trust God in that it will be fulfilled. With this as background, I would like to go through some of the promises God has made for us in our journey. Now, this is not an exhaustive list. According to one source, I found there were 8,810 promises in the Bible, with 7,487 of them being made by God to mankind. And this was from the Pepperdine Univers University Digital Comments. But I thought, as we headed into this fall holy days, as maybe we are going through our own set of challenges, Maybe we have our pain. Maybe we have our sorrow. Maybe we have our doubts. That it would be good just to go through some of the promises God has made to each and every one of us. So the first of the promises I want to go over is unconditional love. Unconditional love. We are not perfect. Every day we commit sin, we stumble, we fall, we make mistakes, yet we get up and then we fall again. In spite of our inconsistencies, in spite of our flaw, God continues to love us. Romans 8, verses 38. Romans 8, verses 38. And I'll read from the New Living Translation. Romans 8, verse 38. It states, and I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us 
for the love of God that's revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's important to note that God's love and the word agape is used here is a love that initiates. God's love initiates. It's not a response. It's from God. And that's precisely what makes it unconditional. If God's love were conditional, then we'd have to do something to earn it. But we don't. Agape is outgoing. It's not something we earn. It's not what we merit. It's just a gift from God. That does not mean we will not receive correction along the way in our journey. It may at times that we feel separated from the love of God. But we're not. Hebrews 12 verse 5. Hebrews 12 verse 5 and I'll read from the New International Version. Hebrews 12 verse 5. It states, and have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as father addresses its son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastens everyone, not someone, not a few, everyone he accepts as his son. Endured hardship as discipline, God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? Then in verse 11, it states, No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. The second promise that I would like us to explore of God's promises to us is God is completing the work that he started in us. Philippians 1 verses 4 through 6 and I'll read from the New International Version. Philippians 1 verses 4 to 6. It states, in all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy because your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Paul reminds the Philippians that God has started a good work in them and he is going to see it through through completion. Paul realized the people of Philippi were living in difficult circumstances. In verse 15 of chapter 2, Paul notes that they were to be shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. We know that our journey is a process. 2 Peter 3.18 tells us to grow in grace and knowledge. We're not stagnant. We're learning. We're growing. We're stumbling. We're falling. We're picking ourselves up, and we keep moving forward. It's not a stagnant life. From the moment God began his good work in us till the day it's completion, God is working with us, all of us, to become more in the image of God. It's a day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, second by second process. God does the work, but we are to be active in the process, yielding to the effort. Philippians 3, verse 12. And I'll read from the English Standard Version. It states, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I had made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, forgetting all the mistakes we have made in the past, forgetting how we fell short, leaving that behind, and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of Jesus Christ. God will not give up on us. So let's not give up on God. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Hebrews 13, verse 5. 
Hebrews 13, verse 5, and I'll read again from the English Standard Version. Keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The third promise that I would like to explore is that Jesus Christ will stand in the gap for us. Romans 8, verse 33 through 34. Please turn there. Romans 8, verse 33 through 34. Romans 8, verses 33 to 34, it states, Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died and therefore is risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. With regard to verse 33, the Bible expo exposition commentary makes the following comment. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect, chosen out ones? The Greek word charge is a legal technical term meaning to lodge a formal accusation in court. Satan makes a formal accusation against believers, Revelation 12.10. In one sense, his accusations are valid because we do step out of fellowship with God by sinning. The devil attempts to summon Christians before a bar of justice and bring our sins before God. Christians need to view themselves as characterized as God's elect. There's no definite article before elect, that is, we are not the elect in quantity, as though there were a certain number of elect. Rather, we are the elect in sense of quality. Our quality comes from being vindicated or justified before God. It is God who justifies or vindicates. The immediate repetition of the name God places an emphasis on it. God throws out Satan's accusation, accusation against us because he justifies sinners who believe in his solution to sin. Justification is something that has ongoing effect, present tense in the gnomic sense, God, the justifier. In verse 34, we see that Paul, in Romans 8, we see that Paul paints a picture of Jesus standing as an advocate against anyone who would go before the Father to accuse us for our sin. Christ died for our sins. He has paid the penalty. Now that God has justified us in Christ, and because God is for us, no accusation or condemnation can stand against us in the throne room of God. Now, does that mean we become flippant about sin? That Jesus Christ is on by the Father on the throne and intercessing for us? Of course not. Romans 6, verses 1 to 2. Romans 6, verses 1 to 2. And I'll read from the New International Version. Romans 6, verses 1 to 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Nonetheless, we will stumble. We will fall. But we can take great courage at those times and confidence that, and confidence that Jesus Christ is our advocate before the Father. He lived the human condition. He understands us and he advocates for us. The fourth promise that I would like us to explore is God's promise of peace. Isaiah 26 verses 1 to 4. And I'd like to read from the New Living Translation. Isaiah 26 verses 1 to 4. In that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing this song. Our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. You will keep in perfect peace all those who trust you. All those whose thoughts are fixed on you. 
Trust in the Lord always. The Lord God is the eternal rock. We have a promise of peace. The condition here is that we need to keep our mind on God and not distracted by our anxieties, our fears, distracted by the here and now, distracted by the burdens. Yes, we have challenges. Yes, we have burdens. Yes, at times we have anxiety and fears, but we need to put our mind on God and allow God to take that from us, to put it in God's hands and let God work out the promise of peace for us. I would like to read an excerpt from Christina Patterson, The Five Promises of God for Those Who Love Him. Our minds have a way of spiraling out of control sometimes. Thoughts of worry and fear can take over and interrupt our peace. But when we choose to trust the Lord, even when we can't clearly see how things will work out, the scripture says that God will keep us in perfect peace. When we overthink and focus on our problems, we forfeit the peace that comes with trust in God. On the other hand, when we trust in God, our focus is on him, and as our mind stayed on him, peace follows. In moments of anxiety, panic, or overwhelm, it can be helpful to remember that no matter what you're facing in life that's causing anxiety, that's causing anxiety in us now, that's causing us to fret, to lose sleep, to worry. God's plan and vision for you is bigger. With that in mind, let's turn to Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. Please turn there. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. Philippians 4, verses 6 through 7. It states, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. It is with prayer. It is with request. And not only request, a sincere supplication, a heartfelt request to beg for something earnestly along with thanksgiving. And it's difficult when we're going through difficult times and anxiety and worry to be thankful for what we have. But God, it's a requirement. It's a condition for peace is to be thankful, to talk about all the blessings we have had with God. And then God said, I will give you peace, a peace that will surpass all understanding. The original Greek here, used for peace is irene, which is defined by Strong's Concordance as one, peace, quietness, rest. Doesn't that terms when you're anxious or worried, the idea of rest or quiet, when our mind is racing? That's the kind of peace that God will give. It's a giving over. It's blissfully relaxing. It's much like a the carefree sleep of a child who has no worries because their parents are there. All their concerns are being handled. And when that peace comes, it will surpass all understanding, even to ourselves. Here we see a condition for this kind of peace, prayer, request, and thankfulness. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 through 7, and I like to read from the New Living Translation. 1 Peter 5, 6 through 7, say, So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and in the right time he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, because he cares about you. The fifth of the promises I would like us to explore is God's promise for direction and guidance. Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. And I like to read from the New Living Translation. 
Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6. And it states, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you what path to take. Within this scripture, we are, see, we are to trust to God in God with all our heart. It's not with a quarter of our heart or half of our heart. It takes complete trust in God. This is a condition to God. This is a condition for God to show the path we are to take. And then the scripture states that we are not to depend on our own understanding. Now that doesn't mean we don't use common sense or wisdom that God gives us or advice from others. But it does, it, but it does mean that we don't depend on our own understanding for total support. We trust in God for our support, but we must do our part as well. Sometimes it does involve seeking counsel and advice from others to lean on understanding from others. Then it notes we are to seek his will into all we do, not bending God to our will, but trying to understand his will, his purpose in what we do. And when we do that, God will show us the path to take. Psalms 37, 23. Psalms 37, verse 23. It states, and I'll read from the New Living Translation, the Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Do we think about that, that God delights in our details, in our little things that are going on in our lives, and when we have joys and even our heartaches, that God wants to know about it. Though they stumble, they will never fall, for the Lord holds them by the hand. God is holding us by the hand. The promise of unconditional love to complete a work that started in us, to stand in the gap for us, to give us peace in our lives, to give us direction and guidance is not an exhaustive list of the promises of God. With what these promises show us that God is there for us even at those dark and difficult times that we will face. The times when we fall. But also God is there the times when we succeed. But as we saw, there are at times conditions for us to receive those promises. We have to do our part to grow in grace and knowledge, to pray, to express thankfulness, not to lean to our own understanding. It's a partnership with God. And as we saw in Ecclesiastes, life has its contrast. We have all experienced the contrasts. And pro God promises to be with us during this journey through those contrasts. To close, I'd like to read certain verses from Isaiah 55 in the New Living Translation to consider as we go on in our journey, as we reflect not only on these promises that we just reviewed briefly today, but really all the promises God has in his words. Prior to reading these verses, I would like to read from the BibleEveryday.com that provides an introduction to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55 is one of those monumental chapters in the Bible. In his maj typical majestic style, Isaiah the prophet calls upon anyone who is thirsty to come and drink from the waters that God provides. He looks upon a people who are so preoccupied with going about their daily business that they had no time to incline their ear and listen diligently to what God has to say. So let's turn to Isaiah 55. And we'll go to verse 1. Again, I'll read from the New Living Translation. Is anyone thirsty? Come and drink, even if you have no money. Come and take your choice of wine or milk. It's all free. Why spend your money on food that does not give you strength? Why pay for food that does you no good? Listen to me and you will eat what is good. 
you will enjoy the finest foods. Come with me, with your ears wide open. Listen, and you will find life. I will make an everlasting covenant with you. I will give you all the unfailing love, the unconditional love, that I promised to David. On to verse 8. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you can imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. The rain and snow come down from the heavens and stay on the ground to water the earth. They, will, they cause the grain to grow, producing seed for the farmer and bread for the hungry. It is the same with my word. I send it out, and it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all that I want to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. Have a great remainder of the Sabbath.